Hi class. We're still on chapter 10, uh, venipuncture procedures. Today we're going to start with uh, equipment selection and preparation for the venipuncture uh, procedure with our venipuncture supplies uh, on page 329. So some of the supplies you will need for your venipuncture will be your tourniquet. Always remember to ask about um, any latex allergy because some of those tourniquets are uh, made with latex. So we want to um, keep that in mind. You'll need your antiseptics or your alcohol pads. You'll also need some non-alcohol uh, antiseptics such as the chlorhexidine gluconate uh, if you have alcohol levels that are requested. The chlorhexidine disinfectant prep kits or swab sticks if you have blood cultures uh, requested. Some packaged gauze pads. Do not use cotton balls, okay? Hypoallergenic adhesive bandages and gauze used with self-adhering wraps for those that have sensitive skin and or that may be allergic to those, um, any tape adhesive sometimes. Uh, this also includes uh, Band-Aids. Glass microscope slides when needed. Sterile needles with single use evacuated tube holders and your winged infusion set or your butterflies. Plastic capillary tubes with the tube sealer. Blood collection tubes. Your lab requisitions and labels. Ice or refrigerant for specimens that need to be chilled. Warming devices for dilating blood vessels. Warming device for specimens that need to be kept warm. And please remember to have your uh, marking pen, preferably a pen that does not smear, uh, puncture resistant disposable container or your sharp container, and your laboratory test manual or your reference material. Here's an illustration of a um, venipuncture supply uh, cart. And as you can see, there's the sharp container, the tubes, you have some scissors, you have your uh, uh, disinfectant, adhesive uh, tape. Here on the side, if you can see clearly, there's your marking pins. So one of your uh, main jobs will be to keep your trade stocked with all the supplies that you'll need. On this illustration, we see some examples of your tubes, different types of tubes, needles, tourniquet, your holders. Uh, specimen cups, lancets for um, uh, dermals or capillary punctures. And then here we have a four point supply check. Always remember to check the expiration dates on all of your supplies. Inspect that the needle, uh, inspect your needles to make sure they're not defective, such as make sure they're not bent or have any nicks, um, blunt edges, etc. Check to see that the needle is uh, securely attached to the holder. Some needles come pre-attached to the holder. Ensure that the needles are compatible with the holders that you're using. Otherwise, leakage may occur and you uh, can get blood exposure. Okay, and here's our objective number three, which is to describe detailed steps in the patient identification process and what to do if information is missing. And we'll be covering this on pages 325 through 328. The patient identification process. Positive patient identification is the most crucial responsibility for which a healthcare worker is held accountable. And you're going to see your step by step procedure on um, page 325, procedure 10 3. The 2018 National Patient safety goals and recommendations set by the Joint Commission includes the accuracy of patient identification. Its recommendations suggest using at least two patient identifiers, neither to be the patient's room number. Okay, remember these patients when they're in uh, facilities, they can switch out, uh, staff switch patient rooms all the time. And sometimes the patient may be uh, switched to a different room and you come in the meantime and the paperwork hasn't all been changed over yet. So uh, that's one of the reasons why it's never a good idea to use the patient's room number as an identifier whenever you're providing care, treatment, or any services. Correct patient identification is 
critical throughout all phases of the laboratory testing, whether you're in the pre-examination or pre-analytical phase, the examination or analytical phase, or your post-examination examination or post-analytical phase. Correct identification is mandatory for accurate laboratory results on which clinical decisions are made by physicians, nurses, and other members of the healthcare team. And patient identification can occur either uh, patient, um, here's an error. patient identification can occur either at either time of the phlebotomy or as the specimen is being prepared for testing. For example, uh, you can still get an error after you get the certification process. So you always want to remember this uh, three steps. Ask, compare, and validate. Special considerations. Uh, inpatient identification. Hospital identification numbers help hospital personnel distinguish between patients with the same first and, and or last name. All hospitalized patients should have a unique identification number. So no two patients should have the same number. Information on the identification bracelet may also include the patient's room number, bed assignment, and physician's name. However, the key information used for phlebotomy procedures is the name, identification number, birth date, and or address. Long-term care facilities or psychiatric units may not require that patients wear armbands. So prior to collecting blood from these patients, the phlebotomist must ident verify identity with a nurse or other provider in charge of the patient's care. And here you guys be careful asking other staff uh, members, um, not that they may not know, but you have to remember that uh, some staff members may still be new and may not be as familiar with the patients. So it's a good idea to find uh, that nurse that is assigned to that patient. Outpatient ambulatory uh, patient uh, identification. Ambulatory patients are normally called to the blood collection area from a waiting room. When calling a patient's name in the waiting room, healthcare workers must be careful to state only the name and not to reveal any confidential or clinical information. Before performing a venipuncture, the identification process would involve verbally asking for the name, identification number, address, and or birth date. The verbal information is compared with the requisition and any other form of identification available. Identification of patients who are comatose, semi-conscious, or sleeping. A patient who is sleeping should be awakened before collecting the blood and the patient identity verified. If a patient is comatose or semi-conscious, a nurse, a relative, or friend may identify the patient by providing the patient's name, address, identification number, and or birth date. The information should be compared with the requisition to confirm identity, and any discrepancy should be reported to a supervisor. Another key point to remember is that if you get information uh, from anybody else to verify that patient's identity, you need to document the individual who provided the verification for you. You need their full name and the relationship to the patient. Keep in mind that the patient who is semi-conscious may move unexpectedly during the procedure. Identification of infants and young children. A nurse, guardian, or relative may identify an infant or child by providing the name, address, and identification number and or birth date. Again, document the name of the verifier. And also here, guys, a few thing to remember is um, if there's any language barrier. Remember when we talked about uh, that in our communication uh, topic, you want to make sure that if there's an interpreter needed uh, to get one, uh, don't use if this is um, if a, if you suspect a, a language barrier, always, always, always go and ask um, that nurse or something to inquire as to whether uh, an interpreter is needed. Emergency room patient identification. All patients must be positively identified. Patients who come to the ER are unconscious and are unidentified pose a situation in which the healthcare worker must be particularly careful. 
Complete the necessary labels either by hand or electronically and apply the labels to the specimen in the presence of the patient. It does not matter even if that patient is um, unconscious or anything, you still always label in the presence of the patient. Make sure to cross check any temporary identification with the permanent identification uh, when these things are changed over. Patients with severe burns are in isolation. Occasionally, there are special cases such as patients with severe burns or in isolation in which identification is attached to the patient's bed rather than the arm. These are the only circumstances in which a healthcare worker may use a bed labeled identification tag, and this is subject to institutional policy. This step should be followed up by the nurse's confirmation. And again, remember to document who's verifying the information. High risk situations. These situations require phlebotomists to be cautious and vigilant so that blood specimens do not get mixed up. For example, you have siblings, uh, your siblings and are twins, newborns, common names or similar names, multiple patients share in a common room. The phlebotomist must confirm identity and always remember to follow all procedures dil diligently. Do not take any shortcuts. Identity errors are preventable. Identity errors occur because of inaccurate requisitions, mixed up paperwork, or failure to follow identification procedures. Collecting blood from the wrong patient can lead to serious consequences, such as incorrect treatment or therapy, and ultimately may result in death. It is a violation for which the healthcare worker may be counseled, dismissed from their jobs, or even sued. Since patient identification errors can be life-threatening for the patient, they pose significant legal liability to both the healthcare worker who makes the error and the healthcare facility that employs him or her. Follow the precise procedures each time will prevent mistakes. And remember, it's all about patient safety. Clinical alert. Do not ask or you misdose. Ill patients on medication may mistakenly utter, utter something or answer yes. Ask, what is your name? Do not base identity on records or charts placed on the patient's bed or equipment. Do not show the patient the requisition or labels prior to confirming identity. And do not collect a specimen from a patient whose identity is not confirmed. So your assignment is going to be to define your key terms for chapter 10. And then for number two, you're going to make your reference card for procedure 10-3 on page 325 and 326 and submit a picture when you have it complete. And I will see y'all next lecture.